How's it going guys? So, I want to talk about something weird today, right? I want to talk about this little bitty Singer mending sewing machine, alright? So, first thing I want to show you is how small this thing really is. Like, how actually small this is, right? I can literally grab this. Look, look, look at this, guys. This is how small this little machine is. I kind of want to play around with what it can do and the potential and why you need one, why you should buy one, and uh, I don't know why I kind of like it. Now, I just want to start off real quick by saying this little mending machine right here is not going to compete with like our industrial sewing machine. Let's just lay that one out nice and clear, okay? So I'm going to come over here real quick. Just come over here quick. But let's just make something clear. This little mending machine is not going to compete with our industrial sewing machine. No expectation it's going to go through leathers. No expectation it's going to go through... You know, six layers of vinyl or whatever you want to say. Uh, th this is a powerhouse. This is literally the industry standard um, right now for automotive interiors or leather working or anything across the board. Okay, this is this is a Conso uh, 1206 RB1. This is their first electric machine. It, it's based off of the 206, which was a uh, clutch-driven machine. But this is like a walking foot, which means which means that both the top and the bottom here, they, they move, okay? So if I get out of the way, why? So if I move this, here we go. See, see they both move. Uh, so this is a walking foot machine. That's not something you're gonna find in a house sewing machine. If you do, buy it and run away with it because they're very, very accurate. Um, that is designed to put the stitch where the stitch needs to go, it comes forward, bites the fabric, pulls it backwards, and runs the needle through. Uh, th this, this little machine over here is not that. This this is not that. So I just want to start there because most of our videos are based on upholstery. Automotive upholstery, marine upholstery, uh, how to restore your stuff. I don't want you to have the expectation that this is the answer for that because it's not. But what this is the answer for is a lot of other cool little projects that you kind of probably want to do, okay? You uh, you could use this machine for things at home that you didn't think you needed a machine for, and you can get rid of the need for hand stitching. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this little Singer M1000. Uh, it's it, Like I said, it's a tiny little machine, but I want to talk about it, and I want to get to know it. So let's probably first start out with why we bought the machine. Okay, so this big old hunk over here, this big old steel body with the table, and it's self-oiling, there's a whole oil reservoir underneath it. It is terrible if you need to do something that isn't at this machine. Okay, that's the, the, the honest opinion on it. We have another one of these machines like this that are, is from like World War One, World War II era. It's called the Singer 111. Ours is specifically the Singer 111 155. That machine is used for leathers and canvases all through the war effort. And now they're great machines for leather. But again, it's a machine that sits on a big table like this one does. It's built into the table, uh, which... As you can see, this is inside the table itself. Um, and then, so to move everything, or say I wanted to take this somewhere and do a little job, I either have to bring the project here, or I have to take this big base off of it and disconnect the, the drive belt and move the table itself. And it becomes a big job, okay? That's the reality of it. It's a big job if this machine isn't where you want it to be, which is an issue because, as you can tell, we're on our race trailer. And that's because this machine goes to job sites, okay? If I do a job site for say, you know, a custom automotive shop that wants their interior done the same time that they're also doing paint or wiring or something like that, that is where this machine goes. In the trailer, hook to the truck, let's go. Um, and that takes it away from the house. For little projects too, okay? I'm not talking about, you know, big projects I want to do upholstery work, but I'm talking about like little projects. For example, so we do a lot of uh, artsy, craftsy type stuff, woodworking, um, and one of the things that I do a lot is for the, the Viking community so to say um i build more period correct viking items you can check those out um i'll post a link here for our etsy page so what we do is, is we create like i said more period correct things like if we're going to have reading rooms we're not going to have you know laser etch them into stone because at the time they would have been hand carved into wood so let's hand carve them into wood um things like that so i needed to make bags similar to this this is a store-bought version um but just a pull bag and I just needed to make some cheap ones that also looked great. And what I came up with is I had bandana material like this, um, specifically cut off of this material, or cut off of this bandana, 
but uh, I had some bandana material and I wanted to make a cotton bag like this one and then I wanted to uh, use our vinyl cutter to do a spray through that is an, uh, an option we're going to start offering on our web page but ultimately it's uh, you can lay a design out on something spray over it and then when you take the, the design back off that design is there it's called a spray through we're going to offer that very soon so check out our website um, but ultimately what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a bag a larger bag than what I could get in the store that was specifically designed for the, the runes that I was selling at the time um, and for me that was a quick easy let's draw two lines evenly spaced um, and then we're just going to fold over and then stitch that bottom line and that becomes the inside of our bag this is a very easy job there's nothing special about it there's nothing complex about it and uh, well shouldn't have had an issue but our machine our old machine from like the 19 uh, I don't even knows it's an old house machine but it's for like doing garments it decided that it did not want to play games. Um, so the first stitch you see here on the bottom is where it was, wasn't feeding correctly. And no matter what I did to try to clean the machine, to try to work with the machine, uh, I, the best I could get was a zigzag pattern, and I wasn't sure if I really wanted that. As you can see up at the top, both of those lines. Uh, but the real issue was, is, is you know, uh, this was our top stitch, because you know, the side with the, the fold. But then when I turned it around to what would be the outside of the bag, it was just terrible. It wasn't even close. Um, so what do you do? This machine was about an hour and a half away on a job site, and my Singer 111 is set up to sew leather. So what do you do, okay? I had, this is a project I needed to get out to a customer at the time, immediately. So we went to looking around. We looked at Walmart, we looked at Joanne Fabric, we looked at um, Hobby Lobby. We looked at a lot of different places for just a cheap machine. Something that was tiny and I could throw it in the closet, throw it in the corner, and when I needed it, I could pull it out. And what we landed on was this Singer M1000, okay? Taking a look at the packaging quick, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot going on here. It says that it has selections and I haven't really played with it much. Honestly, I sewed the bag that I needed to get out the door that day, which again, it's already shipped, but I'll try to post pictures here. Um, but I sewed that bag that needed to get out the door and then uh, that was it, but this is under a hundred dollars. Okay, it's it's cheap. It's really cheap um, Especially for what you're getting in it now They're claiming I'm, I'm not even showing you the English side guys uh, But anyways, they're claiming, you know, there's like some big value up to a hundred dollars. I I don't I don't see what they're showing um, It's trying to say also a bonus value of twenty dollars just all over this packaging, you know, that's like it's like, oh, added value here, and down here is like added value. Okay, I, don't don't read any of that. The big thing that I'm looking for is I'm looking for something I can straight stitch with. Uh, and as you can see, you can do little little zigzags and things like that, which help for something like elastic or something you want to pull tight. Um, but it wasn't my intentions. I wanted a machine that was small, easy to use, and you know, portable. So. Let's get this box out of the way, because this isn't really important. This is just literally a box with foam in it. Now, the machine's already up. So the first thing you need to look at when you're buying a machine is what thread is compatible. Okay? I am a firm believer in get away from cotton threads, run away from them, stay away from them, don't use them. Um, especially with my industry, cotton threads have just been terrible. And I'm talking about like real, like soft cotton threads. When they they're sit out in the sun, like say it's, it's something used for like a curtain, it's in the UV sunlight, or say it's something like uh, you're going to do like an outside repair on like a canvas, which I think this machine could probably pull it off. We'll, we'll test it. I have canvas material. Um, but say you have something like that, the cotton thread is going to deteriorate faster than the material. The material is designed to be UV protected. There's a seal on the material. And that might not be the same case on the threads. So I don't like cotton threads. That being said, I bought all-purpose cotton threads. Um... I did it just because of the use of the time. I wanted to do more cotton materials, and I wanted it to be a little more natural looking, so I got natural colored cotton threads, and, um, you know, threads like this, but I don't think that's the answer, okay? Uh, hold on. All right, so this is the, uh, the thread that's in my sewing machine over here, and this is a synthetic thread. This is fully synthetic, and uh, you see how you can't, 
break it. I am really trying, sticking it to my hand here. Uh, that's what you want. This is UV coated. This is resistant to moisture, resistant to everything. And here's the version you can buy from the craft store. I don't remember if I bought this from Walmart or I bought it from Joanne or Hobby Lobby or what. Um, but this is a synthetic thread. I don't have any labels on it anymore. They've fallen off. But this is the same synthetic thread, but it fits through your small machine. Well, it fits onto your small machine. Um, thread size does make a difference. You likely are not going to get very many options walking into a craft store. So don't put too much thought into it, okay? Um, you know, something like these bobbins up here that I use for industrial stuff, I mean... They're all going to be V92s, but there are, the issue is that there's a di few different charts that say your thread size. So the best thing that you can do is take your needles that are supplied with the machine, or the needles you buy, and uh, compare them with a thread size chart, and it's going to give you like two or three different numbers of thread sizes, and depending on where you buy your thread from, there'll be different numbers. In this uh, bag that came with the machine, there's a pack of needles. I haven't even looked in here, because it comes with a needle already in the machine. So I haven't even looked, honestly. So let's look. They're, they're wrapped up like this. Now, I can tell you right now, my industrial machines are easily labeled. Easy to read. I probably should look through the book because, uh, well, one of these is blue and one of these isn't blue. So somewhere on these needles, there's going to be a label. So I'll just show you where, where your camera at. Nope, come on. Right, here we go. Come on. There it is. You can kind of see it in the light. So there's going to be a label on these needles, okay? This one says Oregon, which is the company, and then it says 9014. Did I say 9014? 9014. That's going to either take your your 90 size thread or your 14 gauge thread. Um, where did the little blue one go? I'm just going to compare the sizes here. Look about the same overall size. So this one, again, I said it's a little blue back. And like I said, I haven't looked through these. Now this one says 75, 11, I believe. Okay, so these are for different thread sizes. You kind of need to know what you're buying, but also I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, this is a 94, I think these are 94. So sometimes they'll label it and sometimes they won't because they assume that most craft thread is the same. Um, that's the reality of it. All these craft threads are going to be kind of the same unless you're getting something like embroidery thread, which is probably what this blue needle is for, the smaller diameter, or the smaller needle. And what the big difference between them is going to be the hole size. Not that you likely will be able to see that in the camera, but it'll be something like the hole size and the hole itself that it leaves, like when it goes through the material, it'll be a little different. So, get these put back in here. When you, buy, when you buy new needles, I encourage you to go on Amazon. Um, you could probably buy them directly from Singer, but honestly, Amazon has been a great source of new needles at a very discounted price. You go through needles, they are a wear object. Um, the big thing I'll say is you put a new needle in and you run a test piece. Okay, That means when I put a new needle in, I'm not going to grab the piece that I'm trying to sew and sew on it. I'm going to grab the same material or similar material and I'm going to do a quick stitch on it. So, it comes with a big old installation book, or instruction book, not installation, but instruction book. It's a reader, okay? Now, this is going to go through everything, like how to put a bobbin on and feed your bobbin through and how to set the machine up. And they did a good job of creating pictures. Now, I will say that about a third of the way through this book, it switches languages. And then a third of the way after that, it switches languages. So, don't get too concerned because you're only reading this little section over here. And then there's another language here and another language somewhere right in here. So uh, don't get too concerned. If you're worried about it, cut this piece off so we have a smaller book. Um, but ultimately, it's going to go through everything the machine comes with, how to set it up, how to use it, and uh, how to thread your bobbin, and so on. I'm not going to teach you that because, well, here's the book for it. But ultimately what I'm going to say, and I'll go through some of these pictures quick because I think they're the most important thing to setting up your machine, okay? First off, make sure your thread is thread is wound from the spool to the needle correctly. If you don't do that, you're going to have incorrect tensions, okay? Once you do that, you need to set your tension. Sometimes it's easy to set a tension, sometimes it's more difficult. The tension on this machine is right here. So this is how you're going to set your tension, move it up and down. 
you're gonna have to start at a baseline somewhere and sew something before you can get a correct tension. So what you're going to do, let's see if I can find the pictures. Here it is. Well, after you get your, your top threaded, let's rewind. I gave you incorrect instructions. First thing you're gonna do is need to wind some bobbins. These are the little plastic bobbins that come with the machine. And this one, this is the one that came pre-wound in the machine. Come to the white thread. And I am sure, remember when I pulled that thread earlier? Remember that? So I'm sure if I pull this, yeah, that didn't take much. I could probably do it with my thumbs. Okay. That's why I don't use cotton threads. Or I try to avoid them. At least not cheap cotton threads. Synthetic doesn't cost that much more, and you can't break it. Um, so, first thing you need to do is wind some bobbins. If you look in here, there's a couple clear bobbins. So you need to wind those. I can tell you right now that the thread needs to come from here over to this little clip, and it has great pictures on top. If you look, it says one, and it shows you to go around that way and back over that way, and then up through your bobbin. Okay? You need to press your bobbin piece over to lock it in place, and then, uh, you know, wind your bobbin. Follow the instructions. That's the big thing. So, first thing you need to do is wind some bobbins. Then you're going to, with your spool still on here, you're going to wind it down through to the needle and insert your bobbin in the bottom. Cool thing about this machine is you can see the bobbin. I can tell you right now, on a machine like this, my industrial machine, to get to the bobbin, I either have to pry a little, can you see? Nope, you can't see. Pry this little plate off, and you really can't see the bobbin because it's in there, or I actually have to lift the machine up. Again, this is not light. I mean, when I set it down, I'm going to set it ungentle, but I'm sure it's, it's going to shake the table. Okay, this is a junk chunk of steel. So, this, you feed it from the top. It's very easy to see. It's very easy to use. Now, once it gets fed, now we're going to go back to that picture I just had up that I apparently closed because I thought, why do I need that? Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to sew a test piece. You're going to sew a test piece on the material in the similar style of what you're actually going to sew. So if I know I'm going to sew on this kind of material, I'm going to take this, fold it in half so I have double thickness like I am going to have for the edge, and then sew a strip. And what you're going to look for is right here. This is a great picture. It's probably the best picture I've ever seen in my life. Okay, See this picture right here? Right here. So if you notice that the knots or the crosses, you know, when you stitch to this kind of machine, they, they kind of loop towards each other like this. So if you notice that they're on top of the material, that means that your tension's too high or your tension on your bobbin is too low, depending how many adjustments the machine has. And you actually need to adjust it down. Loosen the top or tighten the bottom. If you loosen the top and you notice that now there's little arches or it's not tight, you know, the, the thread's not tight, then you need to tighten the bottom. Um, if you stitch and you notice that the knots are on the bottom, you need to tighten the top. If you stitch and you notice everything is loose, you might need to tighten both or one. If you stitch and you notice that the material or the stitches are super tight and pulling everything together, then you need to loosen both of them. But ultimately, the idea, let's see if any of these pictures show it well, the idea is for you to have like this, where your top thread and your bottom thread are meeting in the middle of your material. Now, something like this is so thin that you might not be able to see it well. Something like a vinyl, it's much easier to see. Um, but ultimately, you have to play with your machine and kind of get a baseline. And you have to do this every time you switch materials, okay? So if I go from sti stitching this, and I reach over and I decide I'm going to stitch a vinyl, I have to change all of that, okay? So that's why I say test pieces or test chunks of material is kind of essential. You never want to buy just the material that you need. You want to buy a little extra so you can play around with it, test it. When you cut an edge, pull on the edge to make sure it doesn't fray away. Otherwise, you know, try cutting it with a heat knife or, you know, just all these things over time that you learn that, like, you have to test and trial and error stuff. Um, one thing that comes installed on your machine, which I decided not to use, is uh, this guard. They call this finger guard. And when it comes, it's installed on here. Okay, I've run my finger through those two machines. I have stitched the edge of my finger and literally ran needles through them. So I'll take my risks. This little machine probably doesn't even have the power to, to go all the way through, and you're not really able to fit your finger in that little slot. Um, kind of hard to sew your finger through a machine like this. These you can sew your fingers through all day, and it will hurt, and it will take the finger with it and run the thread through it. Um, not that. Um, so the next thing you have is these little 
put the needle or put the thread through the needle eye thing. Try to get away from these. A little practice of always cut your thread end. Always like have a set of scissors, a sharp set of scissors there just for sewing. And uh, always. Hmm. Wonder where my new scissors are. Just bought new sewing scissors and I don't know where they are. But anyways, you're always going to cut your thread ends and that's going to give you a nice clean edge. So if you look at what the thread that's in my machine right now, you can't see that. So this is what happens as thread kind of sits, okay? It starts to fray and it starts to unravel as you can see. You can fight this and try to get it through the needle or you can just pull a little bit extra out and cut it and waste a little bit of thread that is going to cost you 0 0.00001 cents and get the needle threaded. Um, these work, just don't become reliant on them because they take time. You know, you're in there trying to feed this through now, you know, just trying to feed it through to get the, the thread in there and pull back through, or you can just take the thread and just run it through once you have some practice. Now, when we go back to the, the picture of the needles, which I already put the needles away, you'll notice there's a notch in the side. That's essential for the pickup as the bobbin's spinning underneath, but that's also really nice for threading it. You don't have to perfectly put, you know, put the thread through the hole. You have this notch above it that you can kind of feed it down into and it'll go through the hole. So, you know, again, these aren't bad, but get away from them. This is what they call a screwdriver. This little thing right here. I think it's terrible. Uh, I think just go buy a little set of screwdrivers or... You know, in my sewing machine, I have bigger ones, longer ones like this, and that's so I can easily reach down and get to these screws down on my base plate. Um, but you re don't really don't need that. You need like one tiny Phillips screwdriver or flathead screwdriver. Like this is all you really need is this little flathead screwdriver, and that's so you can take the base plate off. That's so you can get in here and change out your needles and your in your uh, feet if you have different feet, mainly for your needles. But all you need is a little screwdriver like this. Now this one's built from Summit Racing, but honestly, go out to Harbor Freight and just buy yourself a cheap little flathead screwdriver, a cheap little set of screwdrivers. Again, flathead is kind of the answer. That's every screw on here is a flathead, and every screw on here is either a flathead or a Phillips with a flat slot. So when they do the Phillips, they uh, do one end longer, so you can still use a flathead on it. So flathead is the answer. So let's get some stuff out of the way all these attachments uh the cool thing about using these little threads or having a little machine like this over a big industrial machine my industrial machine really just uses these large you know bobbins this is small for an industrial machine they're sold in pounds if that explains how much you need uh, that means that if i wanted to buy something like a gold thread i have to buy a lot of it so one of the big things with us having a little machine is for like artsy crafty stuff is if I want to use something like gold or red. And again, like I, I do Viking crafts. Uh, that's one of my hobbies. And they had reds and golds at the time. You know, gold thread, while at the time was actually made of gold or gold leaf, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it was a sign of luxury. So you can just buy this now for like two bucks. Obviously not real gold, but you know. So you're going to have two plugins on the side of your machine. And they're going to just be on this back side, right here. Um, one of them is going to be your power source. One's going to be your power source, so stay close to a power outlet. The other is going to be your foot pedal. This is how you control when the machine's on, when it's off, and the speed. This machine runs really slow, which is awesome. A lot of these old machines, well not this one, this isn't an old machine. Yeah, kind of, a couple years. But anyways, a lot of the old clutch-driven machines, like that old Singer I was telling you guys about, that one, it, it goes fast. And you have to do a lot with changing out pulleys and gear ratios and stuff to slow it down for higher-end projects because you're not your goal is not to sew fast, right? But in the war effort, it was to sew fast. So you have this foot pedal. This obviously needs to go below you and don't slump on it when you're not thinking about it. It happens. So... Again, we have the selector on front, but more importantly, we have this on the side. So this is how you hand crank the machine. The hand crank is, is nice for uh, two things. First off, you're coming up to a corner. Instead of pushing the pedal down, you just hand crank it. Um, what I do, especially with our higher end stuff, is when I come up to a corner, I'll stop, I'll hand crank the machine, and then I'll actually lift the pressure foot up, which you have to uh, you know manually do with a switch. It's back here. So what I'll do is I'll, is I'll lift the pressure foot up, 
and then I'll slide that material until the needle is right on the corner. Now that last stitch might be a little longer or a little shorter than the rest of your stitches. No one's ever going to notice that. But what they are gonna notice is if you miss that corner. If you cut that corner short, they're gonna notice it every single time. So you're gonna lift that up, you're gonna slide it, and you're gonna get that needle directly where you want the corner, and then you're going to hand rotate it. See the needle drop, and then you can you know, rotate your project and continue to sew. Um, this, this little lift here, you're gonna to need to get used to where that's at. Um, primarily because you're gonna lift so often. You're gonna to lift to put the material in, you're gonna to lift to adjust it, you're gonna lift when you, you know, you're gonna start sewing, you're gonna lift on every single corner, you're gonna to get to the end and you're gonna to need to lift again. One thing this machine does have, and I find essential, okay, a lot of old machines didn't have this, especially the industrial machines, was a reverse switch. Okay, so you're gonna do, in the beginning and the end of your stitch, you wanna do what's called a locking stitch. So you're gonna line everything up, put you know, get your needle just about to start. You're gonna do like two or three stitches forward. You're gonna hit that reverse button. You're gonna go back like four stitches past your beginning point, and then you're gonna start sewing. You're gonna go all the way around. And when you get to the end, you wanna actually pass that beginning point, and then you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna come up to the edge, and you're gonna go back like four stitches, and you're gonna come back forward like three. Um, what this is gonna do is it's going to create like a little resistance point. Imagine like, imagine that you know if, if something starts to come unraveled you have one point of defense that's just going to keep going you know you can grab a stitch and pull it out we've all done it on clothing which we want to say we haven't we've all grabbed a thread and pulled it and then our shirts fall half apart um so what this does is it creates that little back and forth overlapping itself and creating kind of like a knot okay so when you start to pull that instead of just being you know a straight line now you got to pull it this way and you got to pull it back this way and you got to pull it that way and then to make it even better you cut the thread with just a little nib sti sticking out the end, and you burn it. Okay, you're gonna take, you're gonna need a lighter, and you're gonna burn your, your ends. And what this is gonna do is, as it burns, it's gonna create a little ball on that thread. And the idea is that the ball won't pull through the sit or through the hole. In leather working, this is like the only thing that they use to actually lock their stitches is like melting the ends. Uh, when it melts, especially a synthetic string, if you're using a synthetic string, it will actually melt and you can smear it like take the back side of the lighter or over your finger if you lose the feeling in those over time and you're just going to press down on it and what it's going to do is take that ball and flatten it out and now it's not going through the hole cotton threads don't do that as well okay cotton threads don't melt and that's kind of the issue another issue with cotton threads you're not going to have that same protection cotton threads are fine if you don't care like you know this obviously is going to use cotton threads and if we take it and fold it inside out like we would have it when we were sewing it you know, they're, they're leaving their ends super long in an attempt to not pull back through. Okay, and then everything that they're doing along the edges is zigzag, and it's kind of unnecessary for the project. You can do that, but I mean, this is obviously being done in a big industrial machine that's just going and going and going. So they're just running out strips, right? And that's not what we're doing. So, you know, I want to have all these edges cut up or slimmed down. I want to trim all these off. I don't want big threads like this inside of there. I'm just going to burn the edges. So that's one thing to think about when choosing threads as well. And But you also need that locking stitch, that back and forth action. If your machine doesn't have a reverse, uh, if you're using a different machine, you can do a couple stitches forward, lift the foot, slide it back just before that stitch, start and go again. But you kind of end up with this little strip of thread that's not going into the holes. No one's ever going to notice it, but I notice it, okay? Um, it's just, like I said, this is the same setup as what this industrial machine is. I have the same clip in the same exact spot, okay? Um, but the only difference is that some of these machines, like this one, it has a knee flap underneath the table. So when I'm sewing, I can just push my knee off. There's a little flap down there, and I can just push it with my knee, and it'll lift the foot. That's for a little quicker stuff, or, you know, when you're not... You don't want to lift the foot and risk, you know, pieces of material sliding apart. And you can just lift it just so ever slightly to adjust it. But, you know, you don't really need that for this. Okay, this is for smaller materials. I mean, that's that's the whole, that's that's it. I mean, that is the whole machine. That's what you get with it, and that's, that's how it comes. Um, I'm going to plug it in, and I'm going to stitch the material that I bought it for just to show that. And then let's try it on some vinyl. Um, and let's try it on some cane this quick and see what happens. Because why not, right? Why not? Alright, so the first thing you're going to notice is when you plug this in, a light comes on. 
Oh my gosh. Anyone who's ever dropped a bot or a spool before knows the, the stress that I just went through. So, anyways, first thing you're going to do is you're going to follow your instructions on where to run all this thread. Okay? So, on this machine, they do a nice job at making the bobbin fill in red on top, all these little designs, and the general where to run your thread when sewing in black. Follow the instructions. It says one, run it through here, run it through there. You flip it up like this, it says two, run it under here, down here. Okay, do that. Three, run it back around here, so do that. Um, I didn't do that yet, so let's do it, right? Grab some thread. One, two. Use your hand crank to adjust some stuff. Three, we're gonna run it through here. Gonna drop it down, make sure it doesn't stack on anything. We're gonna look under here. Four, run it through here. And then run it through our needle. <laughs> oh god make sure it doesn't wrap around the bottom of the needle okay if you got a little twist in there or it folds back over itself it ain't gonna sell funny little side mission industrial machines like this that when it goes through the thread it goes from from left to right okay whenever you set up this machine everything's kind of the same and then you know when you get to the needle the needle hole is oriented left to right so i was over here fighting with this and it is not okay this needle holds oriented front to back so don't don't do that so next thing you want to do is hold this thread and hand crank it once around and when it lifts it's going to lift your bobbin thread you need to lift the foot up and using a little screwdriver which is why i'm upset that you don't supply a little screwdriver you run it through underneath everything and you pull your bobbin thread out the back now both your threads are pulled up and they're coming out the back now it's time to do your test stitch. Again, this piece would be down on the floor, but I just kind of want to show you, you know, when you hit the button. But this is going to be down on the floor, and then you have your machine, all your wiring's to the right. So make sure that's out of your way. And then obviously, you know, if this runs to the floor, you'd run the wiring behind the machine. But here's what we're going to do. I drew my lines on there when I was doing this stitch, but we're going to cut it in half. So I'm not going to look at that right now. Well, what a lot of people will do, and I am one of them, is I will figure out the distance from my needle to my, the edge of my foot. And the same here, from your needle to the edge of your foot. You can do this by drawing a line and running the edge of your foot down that line and then figure out that measurement. That'll be the measurement you make for your seams or seam allowance. Okay. So what you'll do is you'll take this and you'll fold it over to the edge and then you'll want this the same distance as that measurement, if that makes sense. And that means that your needle is going to run down that line or close to that line. So then you know if you fold over, you know, if you need from the edge of the foot, you know, a half inch over to where your needle is, that now all of your folded seams need to be like, you know, 5 sixteenths. Uh, that was not math. 9 sixteenths. Okay, you want to make sure your folded edge is just a little bit wider than your foot. And when you put this in there, you can use the foot as the edge guide. Okay, so that way you're not really eyeballing it. You're literally like hold this against here and run the other side down the edge of your foot. And you're not putting a bunch of thought to it. There's a bunch of numbers down here, like 20, 30. Uh, you have to watch that the whole time. You know, you're staring at it as you're sewing instead of being able to just kind of like put it along the edge and run it. You can do that, okay? You can use those numbers. It's just not really needed for 99% of the stuff. So like something like this, right? I'm folding it over to the edge, and now what I'm going to do, or what I did when I sewed this, is I went from the left side of the foot, and I set this in there, and now the only thing I'm watching is, is the folded piece to the line, and is the edge of that folded piece at the edge of my foot. It's kind of easier to watch that way. Um, but just a quick, you know, little test stitch let's just come over here where we already have a bunch of stuff anyways it needs cut off 
and we're gonna put it in there, we're gonna put our foot down. This is your time to adjust, so don't be afraid to lift it up, put it down, adjust it, and we're gonna put it in there. Now when you hit this button, again, different machine machines go at different speeds. I grab the threads and I give them a little tug towards the back, that's to make sure they're not gonna get tangled, and you can hit the machine. You can see how slow it goes. It's nice, it's a doo doo doo. Okay, it's nothing too extreme. Again, to do a lock stitch, you're just gonna hit your you're gonna stop, hit your reverse, let it feed itself, but guide it, and then run it back. You're gonna run it back just past your first stitch, release it, and now you're ready to stitch again. Now again, I'm sitting off to the side of this machine. I can't really see it. In reality, you would want this, you would want this all up at eye level, and so that way you can sit above it like this level, and when you're hitting the pedal, which would be down at your foot, you can adjust it. At the end of the day, none of this other material in the front or the back matters. It only matters where it's about to stitch, okay? Why do I say that? Because, well, this can be over here in a clump. This can all be balled up out of the way, as long as whatever you're stitching and going through is perfectly aligned with where it needs to align. Uh, it's kind of something you learn the hard way, so don't do that. Um, again, you get to the end. Let's just say we're coming up to our end. And again, we're going to reverse. And the correct thing to do is look where your end stitch is, and you want to go just a little past that, or a little before that. You don't want to pass your end stitch. What I do is at the end, I let, you know, if my needle's down or up, you start to lift it. You're going to lift your rear foot, and then you're going to pull it towards the back just a little bit as you rotate. And there's going to be a point to where it's going to release. You see that where it just kind of let me take it, and there was no resistance? So let me grab some scissors, and then we're just going to snip this off. So, you can see that my tan stitches, don't look at the other ones because those are the ones we talked about earlier, my tan stitches are very clean, very concise, and very straight. That's the key. That's what you want, okay? Um, you can see where on my first lock stitch I wasn't really paying attention, and it's a little off. You don't want that. Take your time on your lock stitches. That's your good luck, okay? And over here where I did the lock stitch, it's less noticeable. The thinner material you use the more noticeable it's going to be. That's the reality of it. Go to the back side, because a lot of times our back side stitch is seen, and we're going to look at that as well. Down here, I got a little cluster going on, right? If you watch, there was a point where my machine kind of snagged. Um, you kind of want to avoid that, but it happens with cheaper machines. So my machine snagged a little bit, and you can see, and it just, and it just doesn't look as great. Um, normal person is not going to see that. But again, I work on high-end cars, and that's something for me. For you, it's nothing, so don't worry about it. Um, going to some other materials. I have not tried to sew a vinyl on here. This is a test for me as well. This is a marine grade vinyl. This is not some cheap thin stuff. This is stuff that cost me 30 some dollars a yard. And I just wanna try to stitch the end of it and see how it comes out. I will say there's a lot of machines out there that won't do it. And I will say that when you get going on something like this, generally, you have to keep the foot on the pedal. If you stop it right before the needle goes in the material, it won't continue to go through the material. And the fact that the foot's not walking, or that lower edge like we talked about on this industrial machine, means that the stitches aren't going to be as precise. So don't pull on it, just let it feed itself and try to hold it down. I'm gonna put the pedal down and see what happens. So, I did a mistake there. When I uh, pulled that material to the back and I cut it with my scissors, remember that, uh, my thread didn't have enough room. Okay, so when the, the, when the tensioner lifted back up, it actually pulled my thread out. So everything I just sewed was nothing, and now I got a bunch of holes in it that are for nothing. Let's get that down in there again. You can use that, that piece or just cut it, new little edge, so there's no frays, no, nothing in the way, and then it will... Oh, my fat fingers just hit something. It will slide right through. Slide right through. Yeah, there it is. Slide right through. Don't overthink it. So let's try it again. Again, I'm, hold your thread in the back. That's why I did it earlier. That's why I was holding my thread. Um, so now I got a bunch of holes that I can't use, but whatever. Let's go. As you've seen, I stopped the stitch just to see if it would pick back up and go. 
Like I said, some of the cheaper machines they won't. But you know, we look at this, and again, where I was saying, you know, the walking foot kind of creates this inconsistency. You can see where some stitches are perfect, they're a good tension, a good width, and then other ones are real close together. And that's because you don't have that walking foot grabbing and pulling the material through in once. But it ultimately sewed what would be a seam, you know, a two layers of vinyl. And that wasn't what the machine was bought for. So I kind of count that up as a win. And if it's sewing vinyl, it's absolutely going to sew canvas and it's absolutely going to sew denim or any other material you try to put through there, okay? Because this is a water sight, highly durable, coated material. Okay, this is, like I said, this isn't your cheap vinyl. This is quality vinyl. And, uh, you know, that means it's going through a lot. It's going through a, a durable material. So, with that being said, I mean, I think this is an awesome machine. Again, you can play around with these buttonholes and you can play around with the zigzags. I don't really use them that much. Uh, zigzags I'll use, but not that often that I'm going to worry about it on a machine. I wanted something I can straight stitch so I could make these, you know, little bags like this um, and just little artsy crafty projects. I don't know how often I'll use it, but for the price, I can't, can't beat it. You know, when I'm talking about like thousands of dollars for industrial equipment or a hundred dollars or less for this machine. Um, I will probably still use this just because I have it when I do say, you know, our custom window, you know, anything or, you know, blankets or anything like that, just because I have the walking foot and the higher quality thread. And, but this is, this is a straight stitch only. I couldn't do zigzags on this if I wanted to. I couldn't embroider with it if I wanted to. And this, you have some options, okay? You have options to play with that this doesn't even have. This is straight stitch all the time, and this has some zigzags and stuff that really benefit from when doing lighter material. So I think this is a great machine. I think you should get one. I think for the price and how small it is and the fact that I can throw it like in the toy hauler for doing repairs on the go, just just buy one, okay? Just just buy one, sew things, build stuff, build cool things, show me what you build, post them on Facebook, Instagram, and have a good day. Thank you.